there, this is Lily Birdsong. Welcome to Queer Stories, where we talk about everything from movies to television, video games, and sometimes even current events. Today we're going to be talking about a very famous movie that was made in Hong Kong called Farewell My Concubine. And we're also going to be talking about the real life story of the main actor in the film, Leslie Chung. As a brief warning, we will be discussing some serious subjects in this video, such as uh, cyberbullying, abuse, and suicide. So if those are triggers for you, you might want to give this video a miss. Also, a quick little spoiler warning is that we are going to be talking about the story in the movie, and we're also going to be sharing the ending of the movie. Um, so if you haven't seen the movie yet, I still think you can enjoy the video, but just be aware that we're going to discuss the ending. So let's dive in first by talking about the original opera. Did you know that there is an opera called Farewell My Concubine? And it was an opera that was performed in Beijing in the early 1900s. I want to tell you the story of the opera because it's really relevant to the film. So the main story of the opera is about the relationship between this king, Xiang Yu, and his concubine, Consort Yu. This king has had a lifelong relationship with this concubine. They've been together for a very long time and she follows him everywhere, even when he goes to battle. In the opera, there is a massive battle that happens between this king and the new king that is trying to take over and unify China under the new Han Dynasty. And in fact, this new king ends up winning the war. So in the opera, there is this moment where the old king is surrounded by Han forces and he knows that he is defeated. So what does he do? He um, grabs his horse and he says to his horse, I want you to run away, my faithful steed, save yourself. And then up comes the consort. And then um, she says to him, I want to die with you on the battlefield. I don't want to live, you know, if you're not going to survive this. And he says to her, no, 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 you must survive my love. You must survive. And then she grabs his sword and commits suicide with his sword. So that's all about the opera. It's a bit of a tragedy. Um, but what about the movie? What is the story in the movie? The movie tells the story of the actors that are playing Farewell My Concubine. So it starts out with this young boy whose name is Cheng Die Yi, and he is born to a prostitute. She cannot provide for him anymore, she can't give him a good life, and she meets these theater performers and thinks this might be a good option for him. So. She tries really, really hard to get them to adopt him into their performing group. And after a while, she's successful, and then he joins the theater troupe. Because he's a rather effeminate boy, he is chosen to play female characters. This is not highly unusual in Chinese opera. You will see people playing the opposite gender, but usually when they are chosen to do that, they do that for their lives. It's a lifelong choice. So this young boy is chosen to play female characters and he has a really hard time accepting that as a young kid. He often makes mistakes where he accidentally says I'm a boy when he's supposed to say I'm a girl and they beat it out of him. It's a, there's a lot of uh, physical violence that is enacted against these kids. So he befriends somebody in the troupe. It's his only friend and his name is Zhuang Xiaolu. So as the story moves forward, they both end up becoming famous. They're best friends and they're partners on the stage. And Xiao Lu refers to Die Yi as his brother of the stage. So Xiao Lu ends up playing the king in the opera and Die Yi is playing the concubine. They play this story together on the stage for years, for years and years and years. Throughout their lives, ever since they were young, Die Yi has a romantic feeling towards Xiao Lu. So he falls in love with him and he kind of knows, but he's really ignoring it or always trying to divert his feelings back into we're brothers of the stage. This is the type of relationship that I will accept with you and I won't accept anything more than that. So Die Yi is always in this situation of unrequited love, and that lasts throughout their whole lives. Xiao Lu, meanwhile, meets a woman that he decides to marry, and she happens to be a prostitute, and she has gotten herself into some trouble, and so he marries her to basically save her life. 
So there becomes this moment where DAE realizes, you know, I'm, I'm never going to have a romantic relationship with this guy. So he decides to engage in a romantic relationship with somebody else who has made advances towards him and basically offered to be their benefactor. Shaolu later in life confesses that he kind of knew that that's what happened, but he always thought that Dia Yi did it because of that benefactor side of the relationship, basically because of the money that they would get. But when I watched the movie, I really felt like Dia Yi did that because he just needed somebody to love him and he needed some attention. And this person clearly did love him. And so he, even though he didn't love him back, he took what he could get in terms of affection and love. And, and that's where he got it from. So in addition to the romantic entanglements of these characters, we go through a very, very interesting journey in terms of political China at the time. The movie starts out in the 1930s, just before the Japanese occupation and World War II. And then these characters are living throughout the Japanese occupation. They live throughout the tumultuous period after World War II. And then we see the rise of the Communist Party. And throughout this entire epic journey of China, we see these people trying to just live their lives and maintain their kind of order and their sense of self, while also trying to do their art. At the end of the movie, we see that there is a period of time in which they have become separated because under communist rule, they came up with all sorts of reasons why um, they didn't like the opera. So they didn't like how extravagant it was, how they always portrayed royal figures. And, you know, the, the idea of communism is based on equality for all. So they wanted to see operas that were made about the working classes and and uh, the traditional Chinese operas, as we saw from the story of Fairy Wild My Concubine, was the story of two kings and a concubine, right? So it's, you know, not the types of stories that they were telling. So there's all this political stuff that happens that ends up separating them. So they don't perform together for a while. Unfortunately, as the Communist Party rises in China, the benefactor of these two men finds himself on the wrong side of politics and ends up being killed. Die Yi is beyond upset. You know, the one person who gave him affection in his life is gone. And he and Xiao Lu end up arguing with each other about various different things. Die Yi becomes hooked on opium as a way to cope. And even after he breaks the addiction, he just doesn't really want to return to the stage. So the two part. And at the very end of the movie, we see them coming back together again for one final performance where they are performing the story of Farewell, My Concubine. So Shalu is playing the king, and Ye Yi is playing the concubine. The sword that Shalu is carrying is actually a real sword with a sharp blade on it. Um, and Ye Yi ends the movie by taking the sword and committing suicide, just like the concubine does in the opera, but he does it for real. So now that you know a little bit about the story of the movie, let's talk about how it was received. The movie was made in Hong Kong and it premiered in Shanghai in 1993. And it was in the theater for like a hot moment for about two weeks. And then they pulled the movie out of the theaters to go through a further censorship review. So if you don't already know, China has very strict censorship laws about what they are allowed to include um, in terms of content in movies and TV shows. So they actually subsequently banned the movie in August and they banned it because of portrayals of homosexuality, suicide, and violence perpetrated by the Communist Party during the Cultural Revolution. But interestingly enough, the reason that this movie actually came back was that China was making a bid for the 2000 Olympics at the time and this movie was doing very well worldwide in other countries. And when China banned the movie back home, it had this public outcry in the international community. And China felt like this might hurt their chances to be able to participate in the Olympics uh, or to host the Olympics. And so they actually ended up revoking their ban and it went back into theaters in September. 
And then in 1993, it won the highest award possible at the Cannes Film Festival, the Palme d'Or. Um, so it did very, very well. I actually think this goes to show the power that movies and the media can have because even though it was portraying things that went completely against what the Communist Party wanted, because of the pressure that they faced from the international community, they actually allowed it to be shown. So I only recently watched this movie, um, but I already knew the life story of its lead actor, Leslie Chung. And so when I watched this movie, I was a little bit shaken because it's a very difficult movie to watch. There's lots of elements we've already discussed. There was abuse that happened in the school when they were young. There was um, suicide throughout the film. And I felt shaken because I already knew that there were parallels between what was happening in the film and what subsequently happened later on in Leslie's life. So I would like to share with you the story of Leslie Chung. So Leslie plays the main character, Dia Yi. He does an amazing job with this role. One of his real strengths is that he is able to be a chameleon and he really embraces androgyny and that ability to you know, slide into different genders. He was a very famous singer even before becoming an actor. And then when he became an actor, he was very successful at that as well. But to me, the most interesting thing about Leslie Chung is that he was openly LGBT. And even today, it is still not common at all to see anyone who is in the public sphere who is openly LGBT, uh, because there's a huge amount of stigma attached to that. In an interview in 1992, before this movie even came out, Leslie Chung said, my mind is bisexual. It's easy for me to love a woman. It's also easy to love a man too. And he also said, I believe that a good actor would be androgynous and ever-changing. So in his life, he did have girlfriends, but he did also have a long-term partnership with a man that we will discuss in a moment. He became famous in terms of his work for portraying gay characters. So one of which was the one we discussed today in Farewell My Concubine and another role that he played in Happy Together. Another interesting piece of work that he did was, as I mentioned earlier, he's also a singer. So he actually made a concert tour that he called the Passion Tour. So he collaborated with Jean-Paul Gaultier to create this transformation that happened from this angel character who was like the pretty boy to this devil character that was a cross-cultural drag character. And the idea of this concert tour was to really focus on his bisexuality and his androgyny. Interestingly, the tour was highly praised in various countries, including Japan, Korea, and Canada, but it was really not well received back home in Hong Kong. Back in 1997, Leslie announced that he was in a long-term relationship with his childhood friend, Daffy Tong. And they actually had a relationship together that lasted for over 20 years. He faced a lot of stigmatization um, and a lot of people following him around, uh, press that wouldn't leave him alone. So he actually decided to leave Hong Kong and he moved to Canada. He moved to Vancouver and he lived in Vancouver from 1990 up until 1995. He was finally convinced to come back to Hong Kong to resume his career in the arts uh, because his career wasn't really taking off in Vancouver itself. So he returned to Hong Kong in 1995 and then he subsequently resumed his career in the movies and TV and singing. Unfortunately, throughout his life, Leslie suffered from clinical depression, and he was diagnosed with having a chemical imbalance in the brain, um, which medication could help with, but he didn't like taking the medication. So he already had this underlying condition that his lover and his family were aware of. He went to see doctors, but in addition to this underlying condition, he faced so much pressure from society and so much stigma and cyberbullying and people that would hound him and camp outside his house um, that 
he said it really affected him. It affected his mental state even further. He said in interviews that in particular, he became further depressed due to negative comments that he received about his gender crossing passion tour concert. And he even stated to family and friends his intention to retire from public life due to the strain of being a gay artist in Hong Kong. In an interview in 2012, Leslie's oldest sister, Ophelia, said that reporters would frequently camp outside his home and the reporters camped out there would actually prevent him from being able to go and see his doctor. And so he used to meet her at her house and the doctor would come there. She shared that he said to her, why am I depressed? I have money and I have so many people who love me. Unfortunately, the depression became so bad that he did commit suicide. Um, he jumped from the 24th floor of the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in Hong Kong. This was in 2003 and he was only 46 years old. He left behind a lover that he had been with for 20 years and he left behind a sea of adoring fans. He left behind a legacy. CNN called him one of Asia's 25 best actors of all time. So one can't fail to connect some dots and see parallels and similarities between the story of the film Farewell My Concubine and the story of his life. So the first parallel is obviously them being stars that are in the spotlight and living in a society of surveillance that's watching everything that you do and very controlling over the messages that they want to see portrayed. Societies that do not approve of you as you are. Both the character and the man dealt with depression and both the character and the man ultimately committed suicide. One of the reasons why I wanted to make this video is that I'm a part of some online fandom communities for actors that I follow in Asia and I see so much cyberbullying happening even today. It's nothing different. If anything, social media platforms are making it even easier and more accessible to bully people online. And it's still not culturally safe to be out and proud in China. So I feel so much sympathy for the actors and idols and singers that are trying to live their lives to bring beautiful works to us to enjoy and yet living in a place where they're not safe. I have an enormous amount of respect for these people and I hope that the minimum that we can do as fans is to support them and not to make their situations more difficult by engaging in these sorts of online fan wars and things that can really contribute to the mental health of the artists that we claim to love. And I also hope that one day everyone will be free to be LGBT in the world and be out and proud and not have to worry for their safety. And, um, you know, that they can declare themselves and just feel good about that, you know. So I hope that's the world that we're moving towards and that we get there. So I hope you learned something today about Farewell My Concubine and Leslie Chung. I think Leslie Chung was so brave and so incredibly talented and I feel so bad that he's not with us anymore. But I would love to honor him by honoring his works and his life and sharing with you Farewell My Concubine that I think he did such a great job at. So thank you so much and I hope to see you next time. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and if you wanna see more content like this, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. If you want to help contribute to me being able to continue creating content like this, subscribe to me on Patreon. Thank you so much and see you next time. So it looks like today we have a cameo from Baby Cat. Say hi, Baby Cat. Baby is the youngest of the three and he likes neck scratches, don't you, Baby? You like neck stretch, neck scratches. Oh, now you're happy. You got something to eat? Did you get something to eat, baby? What a good baby. Oh, darling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.
Neck scratches. Neck scratches. Bye.